left off here. Um, just remind me this morning of, uh, of the Lord's faithfulness. So uh, thank him for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you and we are uh, so grateful uh, to be able to come into your house and be able to share um, this time uh, with our brothers and sisters, uh, Lord, and of praise this morning. We just want to lift you up. We want your name to be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your faithfulness. Thank you that you're always there, that you are uh, the rock, Lord, that we can depend upon. And we ask you to bless this service. We ask you to bless the word as it's brought today. And may it uh, not return to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Joy now, I'm done. 
strong and mighty fortress. It's not my life to live. It's not my song to sing. All I have is His. All eternity. It's not.
That's an amazing thing. And, but it's also a good reminder for us that the fundamental purpose for prayer is not for me to get God to do what I think he should do. There's a lot of things I think God needs to be doing. <laughs> right now, God, would be a good time for you to do a lot of certain things. But ultimately, the purpose of prayer is for God to use you and me, his children, for his will to be done on the earth. Yeah. I have to remind myself of that. Uh, more than once or twice along the way as well. <clears throat> Even Jesus prayed, not my will, but your will be done in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's just going through the most stressful, agonizing time in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a time for us to remind ourselves of, of dependence on God and to seek God for dependence on everything we have. Forgiveness is important. Of all the things that Jesus would repeat himself when it came to prayer, the issue of forgiveness was one he took time to point out more than once. It can be a very real barrier to our prayers. And then it's, a, it's important for us, too, to seek God for guarding against temptation, to seek him for his help, to, to flee temptation. That's a, just a quick run-through of the Lord's Prayer. I want to continue on then this week with some more of, of Jesus' teaching Really, it's more his encouragement, I think, for prayer and for perseverance. Jesus, in Luke 18, verse 1, and he says, and, and Jesus said to them, told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Now, I don't know about you, but all, all too often I'm reading through my Bible, and I don't stop at times to ask a question or two. Okay, why did he say that, or, or why did he do that, or what, when, where? Some basic questions like that. Why would Jesus say that? Why would he offer a prayer to say, I want you to pray. Don't lose heart in your prayers. It seems like the question or begs an answer, which is very simply, you're going to get discouraged. It's, it's a common thing. Many believers get discouraged. Am I praying enough? Lord, are you hearing my prayers? Is there something wrong? Is there something in me that, that, that works? Lord, do you hear me? Are you listening to me? What's going on, Lord? I've been praying about this. And it can be very disheartening. Several weeks back uh, among the leaders, we had sharing about prayer. And more than one of us Shared, you know, at times we felt discouraged. What's going on? So I trust there may be one or two others here who've encountered that, where you've gotten discouraged in your prayer. If you haven't yet lived long enough, seek the Lord long enough, you probably will face that challenge somewhere along the way. So I want to go through a couple of parables on, uh, uh, on this topic that Jesus uses. One is, starts in Luke 11. 5 through 8, which actually is picking up where we left off last week, where Jesus, Luke's account, where he, he taught the, uh, uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And starting in verse 5, Jesus said to them, <clears throat> which of you has a friend who will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loads, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Now, parables, you really need to focus in on one central point of it, but, it, but it, the, the parable here, there's a setting in that culture. People, when they traveled, much of it was by foot. They might, sometimes they'd have a donkey or whatever. And, and even here today, if you host somebody, it's common you want to feed that person. Well, no less so in that culture. When somebody came to you, it was very important in that culture to be able to put some food in front of them. They've been traveling, very likely walking from who knows how many miles. They're going to be hungry. And to not be able to do that. To have somebody come to you, even, even if it's a, a surprise, and not be able to put something before them would be a very 
real source of embarrassment, shall we say, at the minimum in that culture. So this, the setting is a friend has just arrived. And I'll call the man's name Joseph, uh, the house, the host. And, oh, you know, here he's just greeted some friend who's just arrived. It's late at night. It's, you know, and, and, and he's saying to himself, I don't have food. I don't have anything to put in front of him. So Joseph is thinking to himself, what am I going to do? And he says, aha, my best friend Jacob, he's right next door, and I know he's got some. So what does Joseph do? <laughs> Jacob. Jacob, wake up. I, I, I need to borrow some bread from you. Jacob responds, Joseph, it's the middle of the night. Go away. I'm tired. <laughs> Jacob, Jacob, I, the friend came in the middle of the night, a long journey. I don't have any food to give him. I need to borrow some, some bread from you, please. Joseph, it's midnight. I'll give you some food in the morning. Just go away, will you? <laughs> Jacob, you know how important this is. I've really got to have this. Please, Jacob. Joseph, come on. You're going to wake the kids. We're all in bed. I'll give you something in the morning. <laughs> Jacob, I really need this. You know I need this. Okay, okay, stop knocking. I'm coming. I'm getting up. I'll give you your bread. Now, that's basically the picture that Jesus is painting here. He just, you know, he keeps knocking. He keeps at, you know, keep, you know, he just won't give up. Okay, okay, okay. You know, the parable in it that Jesus presents here is he didn't get up because he's his best friend. He gets up because he just, he won't leave him alone. He, he, he just keeps knocking. He won't quit. So the word that is translated impudence in the Greek is anadeia. This is actually the only time this particular word is used in the entire New Testament. But it, it generally is translated to mean impudence, persistence, shamelessness, in my study on it, it can carry a sense of somebody who's just kind of ignores social custom or graces and who's just, you know, he's pertinent, he's going to say what he's going to say, he's going to do what he's going to do, he's, he, you know, forget what others think about me, this is what I need. And the one thing I take away from that is that Jesus isn't concerned where you, whether you're using all the right phrases. In prayer, sometimes we can get hung up, or I think in certain, certain systems, if you will, where people teach a prayer, well, you gotta say it just this way, and you gotta do this, and use just the right formula to get it to happen. God's looking on the heart. He's looking on the motive. That's what counts to him, not whether you're stating it in some perfect theological format. Now, when Jesus is talking about impudence, certainly he is not teaching that we should have an impudent attitude toward God the Father. He's not teaching disrespect or irreverence. As I said, just a few sentences before, as he was going through what we call the Lord's Prayer, you know, there is a very real reverence. His name is holy. We come to a holy and just God. Amen. So he's not teaching that, but he is teaching that God searches the heart, and we have a, a Father in heaven who says that we can come to him unashamedly, God encourages us to come to his throne of grace. In Hebrews 4, the Bible tells us that Jesus is a high priest, but he's a high priest who became a man, who walked just like you and me, who's faced all the restrictions, the temptations, the struggles, the pressures. He understands what it's like to be to have struggles, to be uh, dealing with temptation, to fail at times in those temptations. We're told we can come boldly, confidently to a throne of grace where there's a high priest who, who understands us, who didn't just keep us at arm's length, but who came and walked among us and bore our sins for us. We can come with confidence to him to receive mercy and grace when we need it. Jesus uh, 
continues on then in Luke 11, and he says, And I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father is among you whose son asks for a fish and will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who love Him, who ask Him? Jesus uses the word to ask, to seek, to knock. And those words are, are in the present imperative, and they can be translated, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking, don't quit. Prayer should, He's encouraging us that prayer should be a a natural part of our life. It should be an ongoing expression of our walk with the Lord. It's an acknowledgement, again, of dependence on the Lord for everything in daily life, from the, the smallest things to the, the biggest concerns we have. Yeah. And further, he says that we can have confidence that uh, we have a Heavenly Father who loves us more than anything else. Even if a sinful father, you know, we're all imperfect. Got three children, I'm now my grandfather, I'm an imperfect father, I'm an imperfect grandfather. But what father, if his child comes to him, or a mother comes to her, I'm hungry, daddy, I'm hungry. Any godly father or mother isn't going to just give him something other than what's good for them, right? We have a Father in heaven who's more loving, who's more compassionate, who has nothing but goodness in store for those who know him. We have a Father in heaven who is more caring and compassionate than the most devoted parent. We have a Father in heaven who is more faithful and loyal than the most devoted friend next door. We can come with confidence to him. He has nothing but good for us. And so he encourages us that even when it, even if it seems like the prayers are unanswered, keep asking. Yeah. Don't stop. Yeah. Don't quit seeking him. He has something good for us, whatever it is. The, the prayers don't always come when we want the prayers don't come the way we, or the answers I need to, uh, the answers don't necessarily come when we want, they may not always come with the answer that we want, but he does have an answer for our good. So he encourages us to continue to seek him and don't quit. I move on then to the parable of the unjust judge. And actually I started with Luke 18, verse 1 is the verse I quoted at the beginning. It's another one of the parables Jesus said. Jesus told this parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. And as I said, that begs the question, okay, why would Jesus say that? Actually, the, the, the context for this parable, Luke chapter 18, it follows on the heel, of course, the end of chapter 17. Um, <coughs> When Luke wrote his gospel, of course, he didn't write it with chapter and verse. It was just one continuous message. Uh, the chapters and verses are very useful for reference. But in the latter part of chapter 17, Jesus is basically talking about his second coming. He's talking about uh, how uh, it would be a hard time for believers. Uh, some believe that passage may also be referring to more recent uh, or that is, uh, hardships that the church would face under the Romans with the fall of, of Jerusalem. But regardless of it, he, he talks about how there, there's going to be hard times. There's going to be false teachers. There's going to be false messages. There's going to be uh, times when God's people are going to be crying out to him. He also talks about how his appearance is going to be sudden and unexpected to many. 
So the parable of the unjust judge comes on the heels of that part of what Luke has recorded for us. It's a time when believers are going to be crying out. It's, it, he's talking about a time we're going to be saying, Lord, come. Lord, where are you? Lord, help me. Lord, what's going on? And it's with that that he says, I want to give you this parable so that you pray and don't lose heart. So Jesus said, he, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because of this widow, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So the picture that Jesus has painted is a judge who's who's not a godly man, doesn't fear God, doesn't really care about what's going on with you. And there are people like that who are in different places of power, not just judges alone, but people in power who are there. It's, it's all about greed. It's all about power. It's all about, all about me. You're self-centered, uncaring. And then we've got this widow who just, she won't leave me alone. You know I need justice. Give me justice. And for a long time in this parable, the judge is just saying, you know, forget it. You know, forget it. Just leave me alone. Go away. But eventually he gives in. He just, this guy, she is wearing me down. Okay, okay. I'll give you your answer. I'll give you your justice. So Jesus goes on to say, and, and he says, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So the, the point of the parable that Jesus paints here is, you know, even if you've got a, a, an unjust judge who will occasionally do the right thing. Occasionally he'll, he'll do what's right and, and grant justice. How much more do we have a God who is perfect, who is holy, who is himself the source of truth and justice? God isn't, God doesn't just have justice. He is just. Part of his very essence is justice. He is the truth. He is the way, the life. God will give justice to his people. His children can cry to him day and night. And there may be times of when we're desperate, when we're discouraged. Again, Lord, are you hearing me? Where are you, God? And that though it may seem at times like he is slow to answer, he will, he will answer. The parable says he will answer speedily. His definition of speedily isn't necessarily mine. Very often it's not mine. I, I, sometimes I want to instruct God, Lord, you need to do this now, please. You know, well, okay. No, he acts in his timing, in his timing. And this uh, makes me think, too, of, of uh, another part of of, uh, will the Son of Man find faith on the earth? He wants us to persevere. That, that question that Jesus asks always bothers me. I don't know about you, but it's, well, what do you mean? Are you going to find faith on the earth? Well, yeah, you're going to find faith, aren't you, Lord? But it, maybe it's a challenge to, to you, to me, Will we go back to him? And I'm not talking about trumping up some big emotion. I'm not talking about acting like you've got it all together and, and never fail or, or struggle. It's a throne of grace we come to. But will he come to us? He wants us to persevere in seeking him. 
He wants to encourage us, don't quit. Even in the face of discouragement, don't give up. Don't give in to self-pity. And though it seems like he is slow to answer, his answer will come in his time. He will come speedily. He will provide his answer. And it leads me to some final thoughts here. And maybe this is something that I think of more since I'm getting older. A realization that for some of us, well, for all of us really, some of the prayers that we offer, we may have offered the prayer many times over, but sometimes the answer isn't going to come in our own lifetime. I stop and I think about, from time to time, the, the uh, Hebrews who were in slavery in Pharaoh. They were, they were in Egypt for over four centuries. And we don't know exactly when Pharaoh came along who started to enslave them. But they were in bondage. They were, they were being beaten. How many men were there? who cried out to the Lord, Lord, give us deliverance. Send a deliverer. Lord, give us deliverance. And wake up the next morning, and then day after day, he still felt the sting of the lash and the harsh treatment from the masters. How many days did his wife look on him, seeing the fresh welts, seeing the scars on his body, seeing his shoulders bent over a little, a little more deeply because he's, he's struggling under the weight of the load of the slavery. And she's crying, Lord, deliver us. Lord, send a deliverer. How many of them died before Moses would lead Israel out of Egypt? We don't really know the answer, do we? God only knows that answer. So I'll just pose this question. For those who died before the answer came, does that mean their prayers made no effect? Maybe, but let me pose a little broader question. When you and I die, do our prayers just dissipate? Do they just go away? Is God up there and saying, oh, oh, he's dead now. Yep. His prayers are moot. I don't have to pay attention to his prayers anymore. Is that the way it works? You and I live in a time-space world. That's how I function. Right? I can only be one place at a time, do one thing at a time. And so we live in that world, but God stands outside of it. He's the one who created time and space. He sees the beginning of history and the conclusion of history and everything in between at the same moment. Before God said, let there be light, he knew every prayer you would pray. Every time you would cry out to him. Our prayers go up to an eternal God. And there are some prayers that we may offer that it may seem like, Lord, where's your speedy answer? When it seems like wickedness is winning, when it seems like darkness is prevailing. And God says, yes, I'm answering your prayer. But there may be some prayers, whether it's for family, for the church, for our nation, for who knows what. God's going to answer them in his time. And there are some prayers that God's answer will come in a generation that follows after. I don't necessarily like saying that personally. I want my prayer answered now. But there are some prayers that we need to remember, stand up as an incense before the Lord, and they're prayers that, that may be answered in a, a time that we may not even potentially be around. So just to conclude then, if there's anybody here who's felt discouraged in your prayer life, or alternatively, do you feel guilty? I'm not praying enough. I'm not praying hard enough. I hope what I've shared last week and this week isn't piling a guilt trip on anybody because that is not the intention at all. We all have our struggles, and I'm no exception, trust me. Am I praying enough? Lord, are you hearing me? I've been praying for a nation for over 40 years. Are my prayers making a difference? We all have struggles. But we can come to God 
that we can press through those times of discouragement. There's a God who hears our prayers, who's more compassionate, who cares more for us than the most devoted parent, than the most loyal friend next door. And our prayers make a difference to him. So Jesus says, keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. Don't quit. He's not offended that you came to him again. Keep looking to him. Even when it seems like evil is winning. You know, we live in a time, you see a lot of what's going on in our, going on in our nation. And it's things that not that many years ago, so many would have been revolted against, that would have, would have just summarily rejected as, as evil that now is flaunted and even celebrated and even demanded as a right. When it seems the darkness seems to be making its headway. Having said that, whatever pressures we're facing as believers here in the USA, it doesn't even begin to hold up to what fellow brothers and sisters face elsewhere, right? Whether in China, North Korea, Sudan, Somalia, at the hands of Islamic terrorists, not to mention what believers faced under the hands of Rome and any number of other people in the centuries since. Whatever is coming on, if we're facing times of, of discouragement, and though it seems like our prayers are having no effect, there's a God who will bring justice. There is a God who loves us. He is also a holy and just God who will bring justice for his children. And they may not always be in our timing, but he is going to bring an answer speedily. And so Jesus says, keep on praying. Don't lose heart. Keep seeking. Let's have a <clears throat> word of prayer. Lord, give us strength. Lord, we need your grace. In times of discouragement, we need your help to persevere. That we don't lose heart. To know that you are concerned about our needs, that you are concerned about our circumstances, that you do want what's best. Renew our, our hope, our faith, that if you return in our lives, Lord, you will find faith. That you'll find not a trumped up, empty faith, but just a faith that turns to you, that seeks you, that depends on you. That a faith that cries out to you. Help us, Lord, to persevere. To remind ourselves of your promise that you will bring an answer. You will bring an answer speedily. And you will bring justice to this earth. We thank you. Thank you for the privilege that we have, Lord. And it is indeed a privilege that we can even come before your throne of grace. We come by the blood of Jesus and in his name. Amen.